Denise. Okay. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's program. It's called Past Beacon, a pictorial tour of Beacon and surroundings that no longer exist. And it's presented by David Turner. David is a member and good friend of the Historical Society. He's also our co-chair of our annual postcard show, uh, which we hope to restart in the fall or the winter if all goes well with the pandemic. You can't close the door. Uh, please put yourself on mute. Thank you. David's keen interest in local history began as a young boy that parlayed into collecting and selling postcards and photographs that tell the story of our communities. He's the author of Wappinger from the Arcadia Postcard History Press series and can be found on the Hudson Valley Revisited Facebook page. So I'd like to turn over to David. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, Diane, you might want to help out um, allowing people to be admin or yeah. to be admitted. Uh, I'm gonna give you a talk tonight about uh, lost landmarks and beacon. Um, I'm not gonna be covering everything. Um, there's so much that we've lost in beacon over the past you know, 250 years that I can't include everything. So I'm not gonna be including Mount Beacon or the storefronts on Main Street. They're just time constraints. And I really wanted to show you things that you may not have heard before or may not have seen before uh, in Beacon. So hopefully you see something new and get a little bit of a better perspective of our city. So I'm gonna share you my screen right now. Bear with me. No buttons on that side. All right, can everyone, uh, hopefully everyone can, uh, if you could please mute your microphones. I am getting somebody on my end. Uh, uh, there's a mute button at the bottom uh, left of your screen right there. So the title of the presentation is Lost Beacon. Um, this is an old stereo view from um, Fishkill Landing. Um, everything in this image no longer stands except for one thing, this house right on the hill. I believe this still stands today, but everything else along the river here has been torn down either when they uh, expanded the tracks in 1915 or during urban renewal. So let me start. Oops. Fishkill Landing. So as everyone knows that there was uh, multiple villages within uh, Beacon that consolidated and became Beacon itself. So one of these was Fishkill Landing. This is a view looking from the ferry house uh, east into the city of Beacon. And the only thing that really stands today in this photograph is the old Dutch church over here on the left. Some of the houses over here that might be on Spy Hill might still stand. Uh, I haven't been able to uh, corroborate that, but the only real landmark here that still stands is this Dutch uh, Reformed Church. So here we have River Street, Beekman Street, and Ferry Street. All of these things no longer stand. So just to give you a little bit of uh, orientation, again, that's the Dutch Reformed Church. This is the Riverview Sanitarium that was right next door the Belle Isle Brewery, which was right next to the old railroad station, which is here. And the Hammond Paint Factory that was on the intersection of Beekman Street and Ferry Street. So just a very interesting photograph of, you know, a lot of houses that no longer stand in Beacon. Just a close up here. Um, oops, let me go back. Close up here of the Dutch Reformed Church and the Riverview um, Sanitarium. It was formerly known as the H.H. H. Munsell House and it was also the Kittredge Estate. You can see it was a large house uh, right on the hill, had a commanding view of the Hudson River. Today, uh, those uh, new apartments have been built uh, in the same spot. So multiple people now have this beautiful view. Here's a close up of uh, the Riverview Sanitarium from around 1915. Uh, it was used for the care and treatment of mild mental and nervous diseases. It was also for a drug and alcohol um, 
habits. So it was a detox place, but it also um, helped people with nervous diseases and um, uh, just help people get back on their feet. Um, the back of the card states that uh, the baths that were included with Riverview was an electric, a dry hot air, Turkish and needle, which does not sound too relaxing, electricity, static, and faradic. And these are all different types of uh, electric current that went through the baths themselves. Um, nothing like an electric, real electric shock or anything like that that you'd see in a more of an insane asylum, but this was supposed to be like a spa in like a getaway. This is a view from the river side. You can see the tower here was added a little bit later from the previous photograph. And this is a view from the front. Beautiful uh, house, large porch that went all the way around. Um, and just, if you look at old maps, you'll even see this cutout here in the streets where carriages could come and drop things off. Even the 1861 uh, De Beers map shows the tree that's sitting right here in the middle of the, in the, middle of the street. Just a beautiful house. Um, that was torn down during urban renewal. So it stood until about the 1960s. Going back to that first photograph again, as you had a close up of the Belle Isle um, Liquor Company and uh, part of the Hickle Brewing Company. Now the Hickle Brewing Company was out of Albany. He was uh, known as a very cutthroat businessman, consolidating a lot of the breweries up there and then even selling beer below cost so that he could uh, corner the market. And one of his um, you know, inventions or how he set himself out from others was his series of refrigerated um, storehouses that he had across the region. So this might've been one of those storehouses. Of course, it's right next to the railroad station here. So easy access to uh, the rail yards and uh, would have been distributed to the many, many saloons and bars uh, within Beacon itself. Um, I believe this closed after uh, Hinkle Brewery uh, went bankrupt and during Prohibition. Talking about the old railroad station, you can see it uh, in this old stereo view from the 1860s. Here we have Long Wharf. I'm gonna differentiate Long Dock and Long Wharf um, Long Wharf is the old name for this um, peninsula that went out into the river. Here you can see the old passenger station just behind the trees over here. And the old freight station, which is right over here. So passengers get off here to get on the stagecoach to get into uh, Fishkill Landing in Matawan, and all of your freight would stop at this station here. But you can see River Street is in the Foreground, there aren't even many houses built. Uh, the backyard fence you can see over here. Here's another view of the old railroad station. It's a very long station without any windows, so it must have been a little claustrophobic and uh, hot during the summer times. Over here on the right, you can see the freight station with the spur that came off of the main line. You can see the signal tower here directing trains. And the station would be replaced by the new station that was uh, being built in 1915. So you can see that the tracks, there were two tracks here with one auxiliary going from the freight. And this would be widened to a four track um, in 1915. Speaking about the Hammond Paint Factory, this is a beautiful photograph from uh, the Beacon Historical Society collection. Uh, you can see the trolley here that's coming down Beekman Street. So Beekman Street's going up. And close up here. This is the old J.E. Schurter house. This was one of the earliest houses in Fishkill Landing. You can see on top of the porch that they are advertising the beer that's being sold inside. So this is just another example of uh, one of the houses being converted into a saloon or a restaurant. Uh, which was very common for uh, Beacon and even this area. Uh, right next door is the New Haven House. Uh, at the time, I believe this photograph was taken, it was an apartment uh, hotel for, you know, uh, short stays or long-term 
placement if you were working on the railroad. This wouldn't have been one of your fancy hotels. This would have been uh, a place for a worker to get uh, cheap rent or uh, a short stay. You see Beekman Street that would go up towards Bank Square. Ferry Street went on this side of the paint factory. Of course, Hammond's right here with the clock and the Dutch Reform Church. Uh, the area here in the foreground that's being torn up, this is being used for fill uh, in the river. So this is a little bit of a quarry to, trying to take the rock and soil out uh, to put into the river to expand the tracks. Of course, the Hammond Paint Factory is a close-up of it. This is an old postcard from around 1910. Uh, Ferry Street uh, is on your right, where this woman is walking down. And uh, Beekman Street is on the left. Now, Hammond uh, also had their insecticide company, uh, but this was the paint factory. All these houses in Beacon would have used Hammond paint. I believe even the Historical Society now has all the swatches and everything from uh, the paint factory. Uh, so if you would want to see paint your house as an original Fishkill Landing house with Hammond paint, you can check out the swabs at the Beacon Historical Society. Again, this was torn down during urban renewal. I'm gonna check out the Bay View house over here. This is another one of these cyanotypes of uh, the Fishkill Landing before they tore everything down for the railroad. You can see the new bridge is being built uh, on the right. The old bridge is over here on the left, which is a small tunnel for the trains to go through. The trolley coming from Bank Square. And this is the Bayview House. So it was again one of these uh, short stays or workers along the railroad or along the riverfront uh, could rent a room uh, for a week, a day, months. The downstairs was the B. Clark grocery store and the upstairs was all apartments. It's hard to see in this photograph, but there was actually another part of this building just off to uh, the left. So it was much larger than you even see here. It's another angle of it. You can see Hammond's paint shop over here, or paint factory over here on the left. And if you notice in the foreground, you see the railroad tracks coming straight into this rock wall. So this is them expanding the tracks to the four track system. Uh, they're building the new bridge, but until then they still have to keep the old uh, Ferry Street Bridge. So they built the tracks right up to um, the old bridge before they tore it down. And here's the Bayview house being torn down in uh, 1914. Again, all of these buildings that were uh, right along the railroad uh, had to be taken down for the expansion. You can see the bridge is uh, expanded here as well. You have the metal girders, you have uh, the staircases that would go down to the platforms. So there was no need for the Bayview house and it was slowly torn down. Okay, looking at Long Wharf again, this is the old Hammond's uh, Slug Shot Works factory. At the time, it was the National Oven Company. And this is the Ferry Street going all the way down uh, to the end of the wharf. You can see some old mills uh, here. The old coal dock is here where they would drop off coal. And one of the reasons I wanted to show this, oops, I wanted to show this was to show Newburgh on the other side of the river as well. You can see there's a sign here that says Newburgh the different uh, factories along the riverfront. But Newburgh uh, had the same fate as Beacon with urban renewal, just more dramatic, where everything along the river uh, up to three blocks up was all torn down during urban renewal. So even Newburgh uh, had the same fate as Beacon with a lot of things being torn down along the river, completely changing the dynamic of these places. This is a close-up of Long Wharf. You can see the old mill here. It's built in the Dutch style so that you could uh, have a pulley system, bring up uh, things from the cart up to the storehouse upstairs. Other old colonial uh, mills here. They're right now they're boarded up. I guess they weren't used for uh, storehouses. 
And on the other side of this uh, today would be that big sign that says uh, underwater cable. So if that can orient you. And these trains are bringing in again, fill to uh, build the track system. And I believe these buildings on the right uh, was a lumber company uh, and a lumber warehouse. But all of this no longer exists. Okay, to differentiate the two, here's the, again that long wharf. You can see the lumber yard over here with the open bays, the coal house. And then over here is, oops, what I consider Long Dock Park. So this is the railroad uh, dock that came and uh, would, railroad cars would go onto the ferry, go across to Newburgh uh, and vice versa. Here's the old roundhouse for the engines. And again, this is all uh, Long Dock Park today, uh, but you can see it's old industrial past. This is from around um, the 1870s. But it's interesting to, again to see Newburgh across the river. You know, again, most of these buildings no longer exist along the riverfront, but you can see the open fields uh, just on top of the hill here today. It's an old postcard from uh, maybe about 30 years later, showing the expanded Long Dock Park with uh, two ferry terminals here. Uh, all of the freight cars lined up to go across the river. Now, this was the principal way of getting things on the O and W Railroad, uh, the West Shore Railroad. Um, uh, it lost a lot of its um, usefulness once the Poughkeepsie Train Bridge uh, was built uh, because that was an easier way to get train cars across the river, but it was still in use for uh, even after the Poughkeepsie Train Bridge was built. You can see it's just dozens of tracks that went along. And it's almost hard to believe when you're walking uh, the nature trails today on Long Dog Park. All right, here again at the close to the railroad station, uh, we're looking from the ferry house over towards the Riverview Hotel. Now this was formerly known as the Meyer Hotel and the Flannery Hotel. And this was a, a nicer hotel for the area. The first floor would have a, a bar, a restaurant, a sitting room. Uh, the second floor had your larger uh, bedrooms. I believe there were eight of them on the second floor. You can see the beautiful bay window and the second story porch. And then the top floor was your cheaper hotel rooms. Uh, there were 15 hotel rooms on this top floor. Uh, so it was perfect if you're coming off the ferry or off the train. Uh, before you catch your trolley up to uh, Madawan, you can spend the night at the old Flannery Hotel or the Riverview at the time. And again, as the tra uh, tracks were expanded, they had to tear down the old Flannery Hotel. But they did it in a very interesting way. You can see they took out the windows. Uh, they didn't just knock it down with a uh, wrecking ball. They seem to have taken off every piece uh, to reuse in other houses and other buildings in town. Uh, sad as it was a very old building, you can see it has the nice gabled roof here. Uh, the barn was torn down uh, before the hotel. Um, and I just wanna note over here, you can see the old railroad station just beyond these trees. And you can see this walkway that goes from the old uh, railroad station and it would bring you to the ferry house. But again, all of this would be taken out for the railroad in 1915. Also note the little lunch wagon. This would be like your food truck today. All right, talking about the old ferry house. Here's the Victoria, beautiful Victorian ferry house that we had. Um, the other side of the river in Newburgh had a very similar looking ferry house. And um, this is what really built uh, Fishkill Landing um, in the early 1800s, late 1700s, was this ferry that connected Dutchess County and Orange County. Of course, Newburgh was always a very large city. Um, Beacon had its, or yeah, Matawan and Fishkill Landing had their industry along the creeks. So it was uh, important to have this uh, transportation between these two cities. But as the city grew, the ferry house was just too small. Ferries were getting larger. So the um, 
the landing had to be expanded as well. So that spelled the end to the old ferry uh, house. And you can see the crowds coming to Beacon, all the beautiful hats here, Panama hats, maybe built, uh, made in Beacon itself. Um, so if you ever wonder why people crowd at the airport before you get onto an airplane, everyone's doing the same thing, trying to get off of this ferry too, crowding to get off. Uh, but just an interesting view from the Beacon Historical Society collection of people getting off the ferry and very excited to be here in uh, Fishco Landing. And here's them tearing down the old ferry house. Uh, it wasn't done again with a wrecking ball. It was done with uh, wires to carefully take everything apart and take it down. Everything inside was removed and the steeple was gently placed onto the ground. So although it looks a little haphazard, uh, they were very careful to uh, have a controlled demolition of this ferry house. But that spelled the end of our Victorian ferry house. July, now it's interesting to have a timestamp too, July 27th, 1913. And here is our new ferry house. As you can see, it's an expanded, uh, this expanded building it had two different gates for two different ferries. Uh, the larger ferries like the Huguenots could now park here uh, with the pylons expanded. And this would have been the first day of the new ferry house, Saturday, May 2nd, 1914. Now in between those two days of when the old one was torn down and the new one was built, a temporary fair landing was built right to the left over here uh, for two years before also being torn down. And once the Newburg Beacon Bridge was constructed, there really wasn't too much need for the ferry house uh, and it was torn down as well. But today we still have a ferry landing taking commuters from Newburg over to Beacon so maybe they were a little hasty in tearing down our old ferry house. Okay, taking everything from a slightly different angle now, uh, Fishkill Landing. Here again, you can see the old um, signal tower. The new railroad station is being built on our right over here. Here are some of the oil tanks. I'm not sure how happy you would be to live right next to them. But this was uh, a part of our industrial past, so maybe people didn't mind as much. So this is River Street going across. You can see some of the old eyebrow colonial houses here. Um, let's get a little closer view of it. And I just want to speak about a few things. Here is the Edgewater Mansion. Here is the Beacon House Hotel that was on the foot of Main Street. Here's the houses on High Street. These are some of the only things that still exist uh, today. So it just gives you a little bit of uh, orientation. You can see there's almost no trees. They all had a beautiful view of the river. This is River Street again. And these are all the backs of the Beekman Street houses. So almost all of this is now gone, uh, no longer stands, except for some of these houses on High Street. So you can see how much of Fishkill Landing uh, was torn down during the river expansion or the railroad expansion and urban renewal. It was just dozens and dozens, dozens of houses and buildings that were uh, completely changed the uh, beacon itself. Here's the new railroad station finished around 1915. Beautiful brick Italianate type style building. Uh, built in the same style as the Poughkeepsie Station, if you know it today. Uh, grand uh, open hall, uh, just the most modern um, railroad station for its time. Um, sadly, when Metro North uh, came through, they tore down a lot of these um, old railroad stations, including Beacon, uh, New Hamburg Station was torn down, uh, Rhine Cliffs, you know, a lot of these were torn down. But this would have been uh, probably one of the saddest things to be torn down in Beacon, as it would be a beautiful building today. Today, this is uh, the parking lot behind um, the railroad platforms. Okay, you heard me mention the Edgewater Mansion. This was Lewis Tompkins' mansion on top of the hill. Beautiful, beautiful Victorian house. I don't know who did all the gingerbread on the house, but you can see every porch has a different style, a different um, 
ornamentation to it, the porte cochere here. Not only did he have one, he had two. So you can see that he was, uh, after he built the tire onto a hat factory, he was one of the wealthiest people in the village or in the town, Ooh, excuse me, and uh, had this beautiful, beautiful house. Very ornate. It's, um, I don't think that if it was around today, it would still stand just too much upkeep in a place like this. Imagine painting all of this, geez. Here's the Beacon House Hotel. This was at the foot of Main Street. So this would have been Union Street, I think over here. Uh, Edgewater would have been over here on the top right out of, out of view. You can see the Hudson over here. Now this was also known as the Mount Gullion House, not to be confused with the Mount Gullion House uh, that still stands a colonial one on the other side of 84. Uh, it was named after the same family. It was one of the grand hotels uh, for Fishkill Landing. Uh, if you didn't stay at the Flannery's and you wanted to spend a little bit more, then you would come up here to the Beacon House. It was purchased by Lewis Con Tompkins in 1895. Again, his house was up the hill at Edgewater. And the contents were sold uh, during an auction. Sorry, I don't know why this is changing. It was sold during an auction and uh, newspaper articles uh, mention that all the women from the village came to witness this auction, cramming into all the small bedrooms, but really didn't spend any money or purchase anything. Everyone was there just for the spectacle of, you know, selling off all the contents of this old hotel. Uh, it was then used as apartments uh, for railroad workers uh, before being torn down. Uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, hotel, four stories. You can see the large fireplaces it must have had. Um, and is now just the entrance to that back parking lot in uh, the railroad station. This is the Van Vliet, oops. This is the Van Vliet house. This is one of the earliest houses built in, built in Fishkill Landing. It's a Dutch colonial. You can see the first story is all stone with the um, second story built of wood. Uh, the kitchen would have been over here on the left. And I just love this photograph showing um, what Fishkill Landing looked like in the colonial period. That this photograph taken in around the late 1860s uh, was really the end of this colonial period in Beacon. The factories would be built, um, the riverfront would be industrialized as well, and we would move more into the industrial revolution and out of our colonial past. But if you can see Main Street over here in the foreground, the beautiful rock walls, it's a single lane, the wood fences and everything like that, just gives you a sense of what colonial Beacon uh, would have looked like. And of course, this house was made uh, famous for um, when it was visited in 1844 by Margaret Fuller. She was the first reporter for the New York Tribune and wrote women in the 19th century in this house. And this was um, a lot of very notable people came to Beacon at the time. Henry Ward Beecher, he, was, uh, he preached at the First Presbyterian Church. Uh, Charles Dickens was also in town at some points as well. Famous ardor, artists, poets, authors, um, just with our beautiful views of the mountain and river uh, attracted a lot of these uh, famous people at the time. Looking along the river again, here's the Fishkill Corliss Steam Engine Company. You can see the main factory over here on the right, some of the train cars uh, bringing supplies in. Uh, the railroad would go to the left of this, so all of this water would be filled in for the railroad. Uh, at the time, the railroad went to uh, the right of this Fishkill Corliss building, so they're being moved over here to the riverside. Uh, this factory built cannonballs during the Civil War that were used um, in conjunction with the Cold Spring Foundry cannons. So this was very important during uh, the American Wars, building supplies, and then it was uh, built steam engines. So railroad engines, uh, tractor engines, anything that was steam powered uh, could be built here at Fishkill Corliss. Moving up the hill, here we are at Bank Square and Five Corners. Of course, none of this exists today. Uh, I could probably speak to you about every single building in this, uh, uh, in this image of all the different storefronts. You can see the old post office for Fishkill Landing is here. The bank building is uh, on the left, just uh, out of frame. But what I wanna talk about are these buildings on the right that say druggist. 
These are some of the earlier uh, built buildings in um, Bank Square. And here's a photograph from um, 1865, 1867 of Bank Square. You can see the William Teller uh, grocery store over here on the left. Then you have the pharmacy and chemical laboratory over here on the right. This was just a, you know, a, a, what you would consider a, a pharmacy today. Um, and I thought this was just talking about Woodcock's gallery was the photographer of this, but it actually shows Woodcock's gallery right here in the center. You can see some of the photographs uh, outside giving you a, an impression of his work. And his studio would have been upstairs of this building. Dirt street in the foreground, this is a town water pump that would fill this uh, old bathtub that would be good for horses and wagons that are coming through. Horses can get a drink uh, on their way north, probably to Poughkeepsie. But uh, some of the oldest buildings here in Bank Square um, that of course no longer stand. Moving south along the river, this is the Wilson School. It was formerly Charles Davies' home. Now the Wilson School started across the river in the Military Academy, which still stands today. It's still an academy. And it moved over here to uh, Fishkill Landing on the hill above, um, above the river. And it had about 30 students, all boys, and they would be um, educated and taught to go to uh, higher education, to go to college and things like that. So this was a, a prestigious school, excuse me. I don't know why this is changing. And now it's not letting me go back, okay, excuse me. I had about 30 students. You can see the annex that was built over here on the right to house the students. Um, it closed in 1913. Um, it was a private home for a while until it was torn down to make way for a Forestal Heights uh, complex today. But a beautiful, uh, most likely 1870s building. Moving on to uh, Montalegro or the Cedars Mansion. This is owned by a New York City doctor called Dr. Guernsey. Uh, it boasted seven fireplaces, which is you know, and a, a huge amount for the time, a music room and beautiful French windows along the porch. And you can see the Doric columns that uh, um, were indicative of this style of house um, built in the Greek revival with the triangular roof and of course columns. Uh, it looks like it was closed for the season here as all the shutters are closed. It was situated on 12 acres on Wolcott Avenue. It was converted into four apartments before uh, being torn down during urban renewal again. Uh, this is the current location of the Forestal Heights complex again. Beautiful house though. Okay, moving on to Presque Isle Mansion. This was on Dennings Point. This is one of the earliest mansions built in uh, Beacon. Uh, it was originally built in 1785 by General William Denning, who was uh, under command of General Washington. It was a much smaller one-story building at the time, but it was later expanded. Um, the Dennings Point brickwork started on the uh, peninsula in 1881 and would soon surround the mansion. So they're taking the clay deposits, uh, building bricks. Maybe it wasn't the best place to spend your summers. Uh, in 1890, Emily Denning Van Rensselaer leaves the estate, uh, mostly because it was so industrial around it, and the brickwork families would move in. Uh, by 1920, the estate is in ruins uh, and is torn down. But uh, here's a view of the porch. You can see one of the old uh, Denning's relatives is here on the porch in her wheelchair. Um, but would be a beautiful place to spend a summer afternoon on this porch. Moving on to our more famous mansions. Uh, this is Roseneath, uh, built in 1856 uh, before being purchased by Charles Wolcott, which Wolcott Avenue is named after. It was built right next door to the Sargent Estate uh, Woodneath. And after being abandoned for many years, uh, it was raised by arsonists in 1991. So many of you might still remember this um, estate, but in uh, pretty bad disrepair by the time it was lost in 91. Of course, right next door was Woodneath, um, built by Henry Winthrop Sargent and his wife, Catherine Olmsted Sargent. 
uh, purchased 20 acres in 1840, uh, began uh, quickly transforming the grounds into a, a model arboretum. He was very into uh, horticulture. His house uh, grounds would have specimen trees, you know, cactuses and all of these different plants that would have been very exotic for the time in the area. Uh, he was good friends with Andrew Jackson Downing of Newburgh, who might have helped him with the design of the grounds, but I believe that uh, Henry Sargent was proud and, you know, really built his uh, grounds himself. After his death in 1882, it was passed down to his son, uh, Winthrop Sargent. So here's just a different view of the house itself. The side view, you can see the beautiful specimen trees, the ivy that covered uh, the sides of the house. Here is a view of Henry Winthrop Sargent in the back of his coach at the entrance. Here is his wife, Caroline Oldenstead Sargent, who would have been at the time referred to as Henry, Mrs. Henry Winthrop Sargent. Um, but after his death in 1882 was passed down to his son Winthrop Sargent, he and his wife Amy spent summers there with his mother in the winters up in Boston. And after Winthrop, his son died in 1916, his wife in 1918, the property was acquired by the Craig House before being demolished in 1955. I just wanna give you a quick photograph of his son here, Winthrop and his wife, Amy, right next to their uh, greenhouse over here. And if you note the cactuses uh, on these Chinese stools, uh, just goes to show you the, the vast array of plants that they had on the estate. Okay, we're gonna to go to the Sargent Industrial School. This was formerly the Rothery Homestead. Uh, it, was, it was on the Verplank Avenue, Shank Avenue, and Fishkill Avenue ordered this estate. Um, so if you think where Chase uh, Bank is today, it was behind there, uh, all the way up to uh, Verplank Avenue. Beautiful old home, old home. It was purchased, uh, purchased by Mrs. Winthrop Sargent uh, when the Sargent Industrial School moved from Washington Street. So they needed a larger uh, uh, space for all the girls. Uh, the gymnasium was built in 1905, which you can see over here on the left. And in 1916, the school had 719 students enrolled. So when I first read industrial school, I thought it might've been, you know, machinery school or something like that. But this was uh, to teach women to become domestics, um, to uh, become maids or gardeners, uh, cooks and things like that. So here I have a close-up of the gymnasium that was right behind the house. This is an interior view of a cooking class, I like how all the girls are doing something different. The little girl that's looking in the oven and the little one over here that was probably told not to look into the camera. So she decides to look off. And the book that I got it from, this was the cover art of it. So it shows you all the different things that you would have been taught, dressmaking, dancing, poetry, uh, cooking, tending to the fire, uh, sewing, uh, painting, so a lot of different things to be taught in this school. And uh, Miss Winthrop Sargent decided that after her death, this, the school would be closed, and that's what happened in uh, 1918. Okay, we're going to talk about Highland Hospital. So the first hospital was built on Russell Avenue as a donation from uh, Joseph Hallen to the village of Matawan. This is the Russell um, Avenue house. Um, this is one of the only pictures I have of uh, something that still stands. I believe this house still stands on Russell Avenue. Uh, when the ho hospital outgrew its accommodation, it moved to Verplank Avenue uh, to, uh, to a state-of-the-art facility. Sergeant School uh, that we just saw in the last uh, images was later used as housing for nurses at the Highland Hospital. And then they moved to Delavan uh, Avenue in 1960 and the building was torn down in the 70s to make room for uh, townhouses. So this is the one that was on Verplank Avenue. Verplank Avenue would be here in the foreground. Uh, Shank Avenue would have been over here on the left and the Sarge Industrial School would have been behind this hospital. Okay, we're moving on to more of uh, Matawan towards the mountain. This is one of the earliest photographs I've ever seen of Matawan. I found this at the Stormville Flea Market, if you can believe it. The person didn't know where it was. Um, but looking at the mountains, I thought, you know, this could very well be Beacon, and it turns out it was. 
Uh, it's a great image taken from North Street. So here you can see North Street in the foreground. This is one of the oldest streets uh, in Beacon, has some of the oldest houses on it. These houses were built uh, uh, for housing for the old mill. Uh, this is the back of the Davies store or the Matawan Company store. This was built in the middle of Main Street and would be torn down to make way for Main Street. Uh, this is the Matawan Hat Factory over here on the left on the other side of the creek. You have Leonard Street over here going across. Many of these houses still stand today. This is the first Presbyterian church. You can see it's another one of these Greek revival churches. This is one of the ways we were able to identify uh, or date this image because uh, it was built in 1834, but torn down in 1870 when the church uh, expanded. So we know that this photograph uh, predates 1870. And I just wanna show you East Main Street over here. So you can see East Main Street uh, would be coming up here. This would be for Plank Avenue, oh, I'm sorry, Liberty Avenue. Or, oops, excuse me. Liberty Street today right here, East Main Street and Liberty. And then East Main would curl around and then go up towards um, Mount Beacon. And what's very interesting about this is just the empty land that is all behind here. The, village was really centered around the creek and there was just some farms that were uh, off in the distance but today of course this is all built up with all of our houses built in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s. Moving on to the shank mill. This was one of the earliest mills built in Beacon. It was built around 1800 as a flouring mill. Uh, it was built right along uh, Fishco Creek at Churchill Avenue or Churchill Street and uh, near the Main Street Bend. So if you think of uh, Churchill Street, that's the one that goes down by the um, new brewery there and goes down to Spring Valley Street. Uh, it was still in use in the early 1900s and renamed the Matawan Flouring Mills. It milled uh, wheat flour, rye, graham, corn, and he was a dealer in uh, hay, straw, and oats as well. And it was still standing until 1915 uh, when it burned and it burned to the ground. As you can see, it's all made of uh, wood. So it uh, didn't last long once the fire started. Okay, moving on. This is a view of, uh, from Tyronda Avenue. This would be Main Street here. You can see uh, Howland uh, Library right here. You can see a lot of the storefronts on Main Street aren't built yet. Uh, this was known as Wicopee Road as it went down to Wicopee Junction, uh, which is close to where the rubber factory and uh, the Madame Brett, Park is, Madame Brett Park is today. Uh, you can see the, our old uh, railroad station here. You can see how it's uh, the cantilevered buildings, how it starts out very narrow and then broadens as you go up. Just a you know, great early view of the railroad station. This is an old coal house that would be replaced by the large coal silos that are there today. But I wanna be talking about this building here, the old mill. Here's a close up of it during the blizzard of 1888. This was one of the worst blizzards to hit the Northeast. Uh, snow drifts um, were up to 11 feet in some places. So during the day, everyone came out to try to help shovel. Um, you can see there's smiles on everyone's faces here. So everyone seems to be enjoying the, the heavy snow. But here's the old mill, the central tower here that would be hit by a train in the 1970s and torn down. And of course the old mill uh, was torn down very recently in the last five or six years to make way for uh, the parking lot next to uh, one East Main Street. But this again was one of the earliest uh, factory buildings made of stone for uh, milling flour and things like that in uh, Beacon. And just a great view of the Fishco Landing in Matawan uh, Ferry. You had to have two horses pull it that day to get it through the snow, but it was helpful as it packed down the snow so other people could use Main Street. But just note the huge icicles that are along this factory roof line. Again, the Matawan Hat Factories. This was the main building for the Matawan Hat Factory. This is looking from East Main Street. Uh, you can see the smaller windows than what they are today. This building would be torn down when the factories was expanded. 
the church bell here uh, was reused. I'm not sure if it was the Spring Street School or Maze Fire, but uh, one of them kept this bell. Um, this building on the right was right next door. You can tell by the pillars here are the same as this one that the man's uh, leaning against. This was the offices for the Matawan Hat Factory. And um, today, I think Macmillan Building would be right over here on the right. But this was an early building uh, built in the 1850s. So it was very uh, cramped and uh, didn't have the wide open spaces that you would need in a more uh, um, you know, modern facility for a factory. Well, it's a beautiful building. If it stood today, it would be great apartments for sure. It's a close up of that uh, Presbyterian church here on the left. Uh, you can see this would be Amity Street right here along uh, Leonard Street. Of course, the old uh, house here still stands. Very nice family that lives there, I've met. And it would be replaced by this Presbyterian church, or high Gothic, more like the Norwegian stick style architecture, like the Howland Library, uh, beautiful large church uh, for the growing uh, congregation. Um, of course, this building would be would burn as well and be replaced by uh, the church that is stands now. Beautiful building, though, and really a landmark that you could see from all over Matawan, this large tower. Moving on to the Bradley House and Store. This was a saloon and store on the first, uh, first story. This is uh, Churchill Avenue over here on the right. You can see the bridge going over the creek. And the foreground is uh, Spring Valley Street. Now this was during the flood, oops, excuse me. This was during the flood of 1902. It was our worst flood in the city of Beacon. Uh, if you can imagine it today, the, the creek is very far below um, this street, but so there must have been some sort of ice jam or um, a large snowfall that followed by rain to cause this freshet. Uh, it destroyed the inside of the Bradley house and he was almost arrested himself as he still had patrons inside drinking while the flood was coming and undermining the bottom of the house. So uh, newspaper articles talk about uh, many of the officials in the town angry at him for risking everyone's life. But this would be torn down and replaced by a three-story brick building that stands there today. More sturdy, uh, I guess, to prevent uh, damage from floods again. Here's our bird's eye view looking from Mount Beacon into uh, Matawan and then over to the river. Here's a close up of it, maybe not completely in focus, but with these small photographs, it's you know amazing that you can zoom in and still make uh, things out. So here we have the second Presbyterian church that we're talking about, that tower that you can see from all over uh, Matawan. This is DePoyster Avenue, right here in the foreground, going from left to right. The old St. Uh, Dwakam Cemetery. You can see it's all huddled here in the eastern portion of the cemetery. Today, the cemetery spans uh, this entire area all the way over to uh, the street over here. So not many people had died yet in Beacon. Uh, Washington Avenue, of course, is right over here. This would be Grove Street today, going up the hill. This is Boyce Street today. Many of these houses still stand, even the one right over here on the corner. And the Spring Street School over here on the hill. So today, Barb's Butchery uh, would be right over here where these trees are, to give you a little bit of orientation. You can also see Main Street in the background, of course, the church on the bend, and here's the bend on Main Street. So you can see a lot, maybe not too much in focus, but uh, you can still, still see a lot of the houses that were here in Beacon at the time, maybe around 1880. Here's the Matawan High School or the Spring Street School, it was built in the 1870s and then expanded uh, with its wings over here on the right and left. Uh, when class sizes dropped when the Beacon High School building was built around 1915 or so on Fishkill Avenue. And then by 1950, uh, the building burned itself uh, and was raised after that. So today, this is a big open lot. Uh, the only part you can really see is this rock wall and um, metal uh, railing that goes up the street. Uh, but a big open piece of land, um, probably prime spot for an apartment building today. 
Here's the Villa Ferris, Ferry, Ferraris House, located at 108 Howland Avenue at the base of Mount Beacon. It was a summer resort, uh, summer and winter resort. It included its own small golf, golf course uh, for many years until about the 1940s or 50s when it was torn down to make way for the uh, ski resort that was on Mount Beacon. So the lift lines would come uh, right up here from this house. Uh, as you can see, it was an old gable roof house too, beautiful house. Um, and is now where the Jehovah's Witness Conference Center is today on Howland Avenue. Moving on uh, to the area surrounding Beacon, I wanted to show you some images of Glenham since most, many people don't uh, think of Glenham. Uh, this is the old Glenham post office. Uh, this thing on the back says that it's uh, said to be the smallest in the United States. It was 16 feet, two inches across, uh, nine feet, uh, two inches high, and then 10 inches deep. So a very small little building. Uh, I just love this photograph, showing you all the little rocks and everything on the ground, how the muddy dirt road. You can see the Glenham Post Office is written in paint on the windows, the little uh, repairs they did on the window panes and everything like that. Glenham was a very, um, it was a colonial little outpost really along Fishco Creek and it just became industrialized uh, when the factory was built. So here is uh, maybe 30 years later, the post office building has been torn down and replaced by uh, a larger one, no longer the smallest in the United States. Here's the general store here on the right. This is looking down Old Glenham Road um, towards Fishkill. This house still stands today on the left. It's right across from the post office today. So this is the road that would take right over here to go down to uh, uh, Washington Avenue. This would be the deli today and next door is Labby's uh, Pizza Place. You can see the trolley coming from Beacon going towards Fishkill, uh, went right through the heart of the Glenham. Of course, the railroad station on the CNE line. So this would have went from Long Dock uh, Railroad Pier. This would have been one of the first stations at Glenham. Uh, you would be looking from Old Town Road today, looking towards the railroad station. You can see the freight house just beyond it. And I cross these tracks every single day going towards Fishkill. Another view looking in Glenham. You can see some of these old houses along the street. Uh, the sidewalks made of dirt and the old dirt road. Just gives you a sense of what this area looked like in the 1870s. You know, much more, I don't know, cozy, everyone talking to each other. Um, that is really more insular than it would be today. Here's the Glenham factory along the creek, along Fishco Creek, uh, built in the same style as like the, the Matawan factory, the factory in Groveville, um, all made out of uh, Dennings Point brick. And they were famous for building um, also munitions for the Civil War. This was the Civil War munitions factory right along uh, Rocky Glen. This is where kids go cliff jumping today, um, close to where Groveville is. And by 1910, you can see here that it was already in ruins. You can see the interior of the factory here and the uh, old ruins. Paintings would be painted of this because of the beautiful scenery and the ruins of the old factory. This is the Mechanics Hotel uh, around 1890. This would be on uh, Old Glenham Road. So if you know where the Gulf Station is on Route uh, 52 or Fishkill Avenue, this is, would be right just down the street built into the hillside. Uh, of course, this no longer stands today, um, but uh, it was a very nice hotel for people working at the factory or traveling in to go to Fishkill or East Fishkill. Uh, you can see that they had uh, an advertisement for uh, the type of beer that they sold inside. inside. So many of these hotels also uh, were general stores and uh, saloons. Great place to meet people. Okay, coming to the end of it, this is Duchess Junction. Just wanted to show you this old view of the Hotel Nishka Daigat. Uh, this was a Jewish resort here in uh, Duchess Junction, south of Beacon. 
Uh, the old hotel um, could be, you know, each room rented out. There was also bungalows and other things around for you to rent out. Uh, beautiful commanding view of the Hudson River. There's a lot of controversy about this hotel. People were afraid that they were uh, communists as it was a Jewish camp, but they were just uh, socialists, you know, persecuted type of people that uh, had their own political ideas and uh, uh, wanted to have their own insular camp here in Dutchess County. But this was very common. There was one in Sylvan Lake in Hopewell. Of course, there was ones up in uh, Rhinebeck and Millbrook. So all of these types of uh, Jewish resorts uh, dotted the landscape, even up into the Catskills. And I just wanted to leave you with this last photograph. Um, you know, I like to show you buildings that no longer exist, but this is an image that uh, no longer exists. Yeah, either. I even uh, work down here, look around down here to find something. Um, but I wanted to show you the people walking across the Hudson River uh, between Newburgh and uh, Beacon. See the big crowds off in the distance. What's who's on? I don't care who's on. Well, I think I hear somebody talking. Um, that this no longer happens as the icebreakers come through and break up the. Oh, okay. But this was something that happened. On the Alternate. All right. And I want to thank you very much for. Uh, you know, coming out and uh, listening to me. I really want to thank um, uh, Denise Van Buren and of course, Bob Murphy for the great book, The Beacon's uh, Memory Keeper. And I got a lot of information out of that. Of course, Bob Murphy was just such a, um, you know, wealth of knowledge. So, uh, you know, I couldn't Sorry, have done there you go. him and helping me. Now I'm muted. A lot of these photographs. So uh, thank you again. I don't want to be muted. Boy, you want them to hear you? Well, I hear you. I want to hear them. Yeah, Harry no, and Ellen, this is Denise Van Buren. We can all hear you. So I think you have to turn your mic off. Oh. Um, but I'm done. So let's have a conversation. Oh, about yes. Well, thank video. you, David. That was totally amazing. Um, yeah, Mr. Norman, if you wouldn't mind when, meeting. I can time? barely hear her. What time did it come up? I got it. Okay. Whoops. Okay. So... Um, David, thank you so much for that incredible presentation. One question I did want to ask you was about um, what, what resources that you use to learn the history of these um, amazing images. I know that you had many, many conversations with Bob over the years, um, as well as using the historic Beacon, Beacon Revisited, and the Memory Keeper book. What else, what other resources did you use? Well, a lot of it comes from the old photographs themselves that when you get one of these beautiful photographs of a bird's eye view of Matawan or a view of uh, Fishka Landing and you have something that you think might be Beacon, you can look at one of these old photographs and try to pinpoint the house or pinpoint uh, you know, another landmark. Uh, that's what really came in handy. But really it was Bob Murphy. Whenever I found a photograph I, I didn't know, going into the Beacon Historical Society, he always asked, oh, do you have something new for me to see? Like, yes, I have something new. And then he would either say, oh, we already have that in the collection or he would dig into it and try to find out the history and put it in the newsletter or something like that. So it was always fun coming into the historical study and, uh, you know, um, searching through Bob Murphy's brain. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so if people have questions, they can put it into the chat or they can, uh, they can unmute themselves by tapping the space bar. Um, I'm gonna just look at some of the chat comments uh regarding the recording the, the recording of this video will be on our website as soon as i can figure out the technical technicalities of doing that so if you missed part of it or um came came in late or know some somebody else that wants to see it please send them to our website uh let's see somebody <laughs> mentioned that they have a hat from one of the beacon hat factories um Let's see, David, uh, thank you, David, for such good provenance. Um, somebody said, I, Beacon has lost a lot of buildings, but didn't realize how many, interest, how many there were. Very interesting presentation. Somebody else said they learned a lot this evening. It was fascinating, excellent presentation, terrific. You're gonna, your head's gonna swell. <laughs> I've included Mount Beacon and all the Main Street storefronts, but as you can see, I was already talking for an hour, so. Right, right for two or three hours. I don't think anybody really wants that on a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and we do have some people from uh, Wyoming on this evening from Baltimore. So, you know, people that have that were born and raised in Beacon and have moved away are, are coming back to the society and, and our history, thanks to people like you and Bob Murphy and all the volunteers at the Historical Society. Um, all right, so does anyone have any questions? Let me see if I can. This is Denise. Can I just yeah. um, thank David for what he does to research Beacon's history, but also um, I know he's really active out online trying to rescue photographs and make sure that, you know, that they're added to our collection. He's very generous with his, his time and his talents. And, um, you know, that's how our collection grows. And I hope that more people will be inspired by his fascinating presentation tonight. If you have family photographs, if you have access or you learn of anything that becomes available, now we have the ability to scan things, right? Years ago, it was a little bit more difficult when Bob literally used to go down into his, his dark room in his basement and have to make us copies. Now we can scan your originals, but be able to use them for further research for presentations like this, and also just to grow enthusiasm about the history of, of Beacon. So thank you, Dave, for uh, really being a champion for Beacon's history and uh, and loving her story. Mm -hmm. But that is true that if you have old photographs of Beacon, maybe you are interested in it, but maybe your children aren't going to be interested in it. And it would be a shame for these things to disappear. I've seen it many, many times where people think it's worthless and it just goes straight into the garbage. But some of these photographs are the only, only really records that we have of these buildings and these stories. So it's very important to, uh, you know, just to record what we have and to save these images. And, and as Denise mentioned, if you don't want to part with your photographs or postcards, we can scan them. So at least we have a record in our archives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions or comments? You're, feel free to just speak. You have to just click your space bar to unmute yourself. Where is uh, the Beacon Historical Society located? Oh, great question. We're currently, or we just moved to a new location at 61 Leonard Street, which is the former rectory of St. Joachim's Church. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we have a beautiful 4,000 square foot building. Um, we are really excited about sharing it with our members and our community as soon as we are open to the public. Hi, everybody. My name's Deb. Um, my family moved, left Boy Street in 1968. I was turning uh, 12 that year, went to Rombaut up until the seventh grade. It's amazing how, how much I remember from the time I grew up there up until that point. Uh, and I terribly, terribly missed Beacon when I wish we didn't have to go. We moved to Garrison. And uh, as soon as I got my driver's license, I would take rides down into Beacon and say hello to some old friends. And as you were naming the streets, it was, it was ringing bells in my head. What, what year was that photo taken of Boy Street? I was staring at it, enlarging it. And I, th I thought I saw maybe two houses were on that street. It's a hill, Boy mm -hmm. Street. Probably around 1880, I would say, as the second the Presbyterian church, the Gothic one was already built. So it was after the 1870s. Uh, and the Spring Street School was also built. So uh, that was also built in the early 1870s. So maybe 1875 to about 1885. Um, oh my but goodness. the dramatic difference between uh, that earlier photograph of Matawan with the empty uh, farm field in the background. And by 1880, all the houses started to get built along to Poister, Washington, Boyce, and Grove Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Washington. I was up and down Washington a lot. Um, uh, St. Joachim's is where I had my first. When we bought, the, my father bought the house in 1962. And the people that lived there, I recall there were was a man and a woman. They were very elderly. And they had been in that house, 17 Boy Street, for a, a, a good 50 years hmm. and I remember finding down in the cellar some old we my sister and brother and I found we were always exploring and they had left behind uh, some canned 
Oh, wow. um, you know, the old wig canning, you know, the old, I don't even rec I don't remember what it was in there, but it was interesting to see that. I was like, no, we can't eat that now, you know? <laughs> and I That's wish I had saved that stuff. <clears throat> Cause I mean, that dated back, it must've dated back to, uh, you know, the fifties, the forties and the fifties. <clears throat> what a, what a wonderful place to grow up. I'm, I was so blessed to have lived there for a while. Well, I live right off of Boyce Street today. I live on Master's Place on the bottom of the hill. So I know. Oh, I know my, yeah, yeah. That's I had my first bicycle accident there. <laughs> as you make that curve. Yeah. I think there's a little street. Is it May Street? Yeah, May Street. The bottom of the hill. And there's that little street that connects to Master's Place. Mm -hmm. uh, Diane? Yeah. Um, Maybe you could let us know what some of the upcoming programs are that are sure. ahead. Yes. Thank you. Um, our next program is June 8th, which is a, usually, we usually have our programs the fourth Tuesday of the month, but our next program will be coming up very soon on June 8th with Harv Hilovitz on the new research and listening to Native America in 2021. That will also be a, a digital program. And then in July, we're having the director of the Havistra Brick Museum, Rachel Whitlow, talk about the interrelationship between the Havistra Brickyards and the Beacon Brickyards. Um, and I did want to mention um, the newsletter that we you would get as a member. Would send it. We send it out twelve times a year. As an, as I mentioned, Denise, um, who's on online with us writes really interesting and informative articles about the history of Beacon. Um, but as a member, you're really showing your support for the work that we do at the Historical Society. We do have rent to pay. We have oil bills to pay. We're buying archival boxes to help um, preserve our materials. So um, if you are not a member, it's only $25. Uh, please join us. We, you can do it directly through our website, or you can send a check. Uh, through the mail to P.O. Box 89. Uh, I there was a couple of other questions. Um, some uh, Jim wanted to know how, about the stamped date captions and how they got added to the images. Uh, so that's a collection that was donated by the Newburgh Historical Society in the early 90s to the Beacon Historical Society. And it was used by the railroad company to document everything that was along the railroad that was going to be torn down or changed. So every one of those photographs is date stamped and in chronological order uh, showing how they progressed through this. It was for insurance purposes to show, you know, the buildings that were going to tear down and the buildings that were going to be built. So there weren't anything of like a, a person taking documenting it for history. It was really actually for uh, insurance purposes for the railroad. But uh, thank God it's I don't know, they, the Newburgh Historical Society uh, saved them as it's some of the best photographs that we have of Fishkill Landing showing all of the old houses. As you can see in those photographs, there's dozens and dozens of houses that don't exist anymore. Uh, these are some of our only photographs that we have uh, of that area. And I just spent the past uh, three weeks scanning it all and putting them in plastic sleeves. So they're all protected now and no one ever has to touch them again. They're all digitized. So uh, they'll be protected for at least the next hundred years. And what's so nice about the, the synergy of local historical societies helping each other with their collections and then volunteers like David, who is willing to scan and protect them in the sleeves. And then uh, David was talking about how he learned about the collection through Bob's a Memory Keeper book. Can you talk about that, David? Oh, yes. Um, I was looking through it uh, the other day and it was one of his newsletters that he came across it. And he said that we got this great collection of uh, um, old photographs from Newburgh of the riverfront. And it's funny because I went to um, Diane here and I asked her if this, uh, they just moved to their new location, if this had to be unpacked at all. And she says, yes, that it might be somewhere in the house. I'm not exactly sure where it is. And I said, oh, these are the stereo views. And then right next to it was this album of uh, photographs. So it was kismet. So I have to thank yeah. uh, Diane as well. Um, but that, uh, that book, The Beacon's Memory Keeper, um, is just such a wealth of information that it really, really shows almost every single building that I've talked about today. Yeah, and that book is available on our website, as well as at Beacon Bath and Bubble, um, Bob's Corner Store, Beacon Delights, and Vogels in town, um, right outside of town. 
Are locals, it's right outside of town? Yes, they moved to right near Dutchess Stadium. Oh, okay, because the only locals, I'm Judy Vance. I I grew up in Beacon. My, mm -hmm. my mother's name was Aaron first and then Fedorichek. She was a public health nurse in Beacon. And um, right now, well, I've been in Houston now for 53 years. And anyway, but um, the only Vogels I knew of or that name rings a bell was the pharmacy. Yes, that's correct. So Vogels Pharmacy was located on Main Street, as you know, uh -huh. about two years ago, if I'm staying corrected. They moved um, to 90 right outside of, um, on the other side of the bridge, right by the Dutchess Stadium. Oh, okay. Okay, I know where that is. I mean, we go we go home quite a bit, or we go back to Beacon quite a bit. And, you know, I always take my kids to the Elp Sweet Shop uh -huh. because um, we used to get our Easter candy from them. And, uh, you know, one day here in Houston, oh God, quite a while ago now, probably almost 45, 50 years, um, there, there was a little newspaper that we had in our little neighborhood. And suddenly there was uh, a picture of Pete Shergalis and the Alp Sweet House with his um, bunny rabbit, you know, his Easter rabbit and stuff. And lo and behold, uh, Georgia Shergalis, his niece, I uh, had moved to Houston and she had opened her little chocolate store right up the road from me. Hmm. So uh, we grew up eating, or my kids grew up eating Alps chocolate. <laughs> and um, I took them there, you know, this year. we always go there every time we come back to Beacon. I mean, and all, but I took my daughter and my kids, my grandchildren there uh, about two years ago when we were up. And oh my God, they just thought they were in heaven, you know, and stuff. And then I used to have to send them Easter candy from there. <laughs> so, Diane, maybe you could yeah. uh, share the, the Historical Society's website to let everybody know where they can uh, find out more information. Sure. I'm going to ask, uh, David, I know, has to go to another meeting. So I know David's going to say good night. David, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yes. Um, thank you, David. David. Thank you so much. That was very enlightening. Thank you. It was fun. Yeah. It. Let's see if I can quickly find uh, the website. Give me a second. Um, <laughs> I have so many things open right now. <laughs> there we go. Yes, if you haven't seen our website, it is quite lovely. Okay, so we open to uh, the beautiful book that Denise created, Beacon's Memory Keeper and Storyteller. And if you scroll down, you can see a virtual exhibit and whatever, pro whatever current programs that we're going to have as well as our gift shop. So I'm gonna just click on shop now because I'm very proud of all the products that we have to sell and all the proceeds benefit the Historical Society. You can also become a member by clicking right here, um, Beacon Historical Society membership. And the books that Bob has created, we have our t-shirt, souvenir plates from the Centennial, et cetera, and t-shirts from Bannermans and some ornaments. Um, let's see, go back to home. And we have a virtual exhibit, another example of, of lost um, buildings. Oh dear, it's not working. How do you like that? I'll have to fix that. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, to get to future events, you, you just go onto the calendar of events and you click on the Zoom link. Our next one, as I mentioned, is June 8th. And then all of the old programs you will be able to see, um, if you go into past events, you can click on the, uh, the videos to watch them. And I'm a little bit behind in posting the current, uh, the past recent programs because I'm still learning to use a lot of new programs. Um, here you can visit Bob's blogs. He wrote, I think there are 68 
um, stories, additional stories that are, were not posted in the Beacon's Memory Keeper book. So there's just more delightful, informative stories um, written by Bob under the, the blog. And um, a beautiful tribute to Bob Murphy is on this page. Bob is definitely our hero. So you can read about Bob here. Um, and then of course, donating by becoming a member. I have to wait for this to download. You can uh, make a donation here. It goes directly to PayPal. And there's a place for volunteering. And, um, you know, just click on all the buttons and visit different, pl different things. So I hope you come to visit us soon when we are open to the public. Here's um, the map. Here's uh, St. Jochum's Church. And here's our, our home on the oh, map. Okay. 18 Just to give you a little orientation. And if you have any questions, you can, you can fill out the form here. And it goes directly to our email. And I can um, answer your questions. Now, you talked about Bob Murphy. Yes. Was, okay. Um, I went to school with the Linda Murphy. And uh, her dad did photography. He worked at Texas, Texaco. Mm -hmm. And then he did photography. And uh, he took pictures. Well, he did our, our photography at our wedding. Yes. And uh, to see any relation to this gentleman that wrote the memory keeper? I think Denise could answer that. I believe that is one of the sisters. Diane, uh, Denise, are you still there? I know that Bob's father was a photographer and he did weddings and he worked at Texaco. So I would pretty much assume it's. I bet sister. that's him. Yeah. Yeah. He was a lovely person and they were a lovely family. Yes. And, uh, you know, I went to school with Linda, and then I think she had an older sister and stuff. But um, yes. we had um, If it's Bar Barbara, I believe Barbara and his sister Diane are on the Zoom right now, but they don't have access to a microphone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, I'm sure they'd shout out a hello to yeah. you. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. okay. All so. right. Well, if, with that, I'd like to wrap up the evening and thank everybody for coming. Uh, it was a great night. David is just phenomenal researcher and, you know, devotee of Beacon's history. And we're very fortunate to have him as a member and a volunteer. And again, if you have photographs or postcards or any ephemera that you'd like to share about the history of Beacon, we would love to see it. Um, we would love to have you. Can't wait to open our new facility for all. And thank you so much for coming. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Have a good night, everybody. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.